Welcome to our webinar today is March 31st. It's just about noon. And um, I'm Georgia Davis, and I'm the site manager at Casa Navarro. Um, today with us, we have uh, Rachel Galan, who is the assistant manager at Cattle Mounds State Historic Site. Um, Rachel is going to talk to us about um, the about medicinal plants and about all the um, um, native plants um, in the Caddo Mounds area and actually in Texas. Um, before that, let me tell you guys, and let me apologize ahead of time, we have um, still got some construction going on around Casa Nevado. So if you hear some loud bangs, that's what, that's what it is. Um, I just heard some a little while ago. So still lots of dust and stuff going around, uh, going around us, happening around us. And, um, but we're open, we're open our same hours that we've always had Tuesday through Saturday, eight to five, excuse me, sorry, 10 to five. And on Sundays, noon to five, um, come see us. We've actually had quite a few visitors. A lot of people telling us that we're hard to find because of all the construction around us. But um, once they find us, they are, um, really happy that they did because they're um we're a great site and they um um seem to enjoy their visits so um without further ado let's welcome rachel galan rachel thank you so much for agreeing to do this i'm i'm really yeah. so excited i think you you have so much to offer and and you just you're just like a wonder woman of nature and and um all kinds of things. You're kind of like a, like an earth mother, I think. And at least that's, <laughs> at least that's how I think of you. And, and uh, anyway, I'm going to let you take over. So thanks, Rachel. All right. Thanks, Georgia. <laughs> I'm that's, sorry. I didn't mean to embarrass you, but that's pretty high praise. I, I, um, I learn a lot from a lot of people. Um, I know. I'm, I'm fortunate in my position here at Caddo Mounds to be able to schedule programming around things that interest me. So there has been a lot of um, programming around um, wild foraging and wild plant medicine and all sorts of things. So it's been fun, fun learning experience. Are, are you ready for me to share my screen? Sure, sure. Let's. All right, how does that look? Looks great, looks great. Okay, everybody, well, welcome. Um, I really wish I could have you all here where I could see your faces and we could um, hang out with the plants together, but this is the next best thing and um, hopefully you will get to visit us in the future. So we are Caddo Mound State Historic Site in Alto, Texas, which is deep east Texas. Um, we are 400 acres of sacred ancestral land um, of the Caddo people and the most important thing about that is they're still living Caddo people. So the Caddo Nation is located in Binger, Oklahoma. Um, there are about 7,000 enrolled members of the Caddo Nation. And um, unfortunately, they are not in our space anymore. Um, first, they were pushed westward by encroaching Anglos and other um, tribes that were um, trying to move to safer ground. Eventually they were moved west to the Brazos River area. And then um, in the night to early 19, mid 1900s, they were moved to um, Oklahoma, to um, Indian territory in Oklahoma. So we do everything in our power to be um, good custodians of this land and work as closely as we can with the Caddo today and program and conservation efforts with the land and how we tell their story. Um, so again, we're 400 acre space. There are three large earthen mounds here at Caddo Mounds. Um, the occupation, early Caddo occupation of mound builders were here about 750 to 1250 AD. Um, there were still Caddo in the area when the French and Spanish came through um, and until about the mid 19th century. So these are some shots of our site. Um, now, in, unfortunately, in April 2019, we were hit by an EF3 tornado. Um, it happened during Caddo Culture Day celebration. We had about 80 people on site. Um, it demolished the museum and the traditional grass house. Um, oops. And the traditional grass house um, 
at the site, but we are rebuilding. So this is a shot from this morning, actually, of our new museum that's going up. Um, and next in July, we will be rebuilding the Caddo Grass House. Um, we have a right now a build team of five Caddo women. Um, this is a big community. project. It'll happen in July. Um, more information soon. Um, I do the social media for the site. And so Facebook and um, Instagram are great places to find out what's going on and volunteer opportunities. We also have a Friends of Cattle Mound group that supports everything we do. Um, and there is a Friends of Caddo Mounds Facebook group. Um, we meet the third Thursday of the month at six o'clock. Um, and we now have a Zoom option since COVID and we're gonna keep that in place. So you're welcome to join us for that too. All right, this is our Snake Woman's Garden, which is our interpretive garden. We're not gonna be spending most of our hour in the garden, but the Caddo were the first farmers of Texas. Um, Snake Woman is um, from the, the uh, Caddo story about how we received, all the people of the world received seeds. She brought seeds down to all the people of the world. Um, and so in this garden, we have a timeline of Caddo agriculture. So those things that would have been grown by the earliest Caddo in um, 750, 800 AD, um, a lot of things that farmers today try to rid their fields of, of things like uh, lamb's quarter. Um, and it moves around in time to a three sisters, corn, beans, and squash mounted um, garden and to a modern cookie garden. So this actually survived the tornado. And in doing so has become a really strong symbol of renewal and resilience and very important to not just those of us on site, but to our Caddo partners as well. Um, and so hopefully you can see that it's a it's a beautiful, beautiful thing and allows us to bring lots of children and all sorts of people into the garden and talk about the Caddo history and, um, and agriculture. Now the Caddo would have also tended the wild spaces. Um, so they, you know, blackberries and grapes and nut trees, things would have been tended in place, not necessarily in gardens like we think of. Um, and so this is where we're gonna spend our time. Although I will say that our garden, we have shifted our view for those gardeners um, out there. Um, instead of weeding our garden, we talk about harvesting because a lot of the, the plants that we're going to learn about today um, show up in our garden all the time. So um, we try to harvest and use those as much as we can. Okay, so um, let's get to the foraging. And, and I told Georgia that um, if y'all have questions, I can't, I can't see you're actually um, um, I'm not gonna be able to check chat, but Georgia's in charge of that. So if you have questions, um, Feel free. You yeah. can stop me during this. This is, you know, sure. And if, if they would please do uh, do use the, the question and answer. I turned chat off um, just because, um, yeah, I, I, it's not something that we're going to be using. If someone did ask a question and I'll, I'll ask you that here after a bit, but, um, um, but, um, oh, you know what's, um, Someone, well, this is a this is a question for our THC um, folks, but someone did ask about closed captioning, and I I don't I don't know what the answer to that is. Asked if we would have this available at a, on a YouTube site, and I don't know. Actually, our THC uh, producer is is responding to that um, okay. right now. So so I guess go ahead and okay. go ahead and proceed. Well, let's get to foraging. So I don't know. Um, how many of y'all out there um, are already, um, you know, um, adventurous in the foraging world um, of wild food and medicine? Um, this has been a learning process for me since I started here in 2014. I quickly realized um, we had the Native Plant Society out here looking at plants. And once you sort of get into that, it's really addictive. Um, mm. But plants are also, no matter what our ancestry is, where we come from, our oldest relationships are with plants. They are the oldest form of healing, except for maybe touch. Um, they are our first sources of food. 
So plants are just a wonderful universal way to connect all of us um, in our histories. So um, that is just, it's become a really important piece of what I do out here, um, I think. And, and plus there's 400 acres of beautiful, beautiful space to um, wander around and play with plants. <laughs> um, so let's start with some ground rules for foraging. Um, and I'm gonna share some resources at the end because um, there's lots of free resources out there about where you can get more information. But when you set off to look for food, um, wild plants for food or medicine, you really need to know what it is you're harvesting. So I would highly recommend going with someone who knows or getting some great field guides or looking around where you are for, um, there's usually quite a few um, plant walks and um, if you're lucky enough, herb schools and things like that where you can, where you can learn. Um, you wanna be careful about where you're looking at plants if you're gonna be eating or making medicine from them. So just be conscious of that. Um, if places um, are sprayed a lot, or if you know that there's like um, heavy metal contamination, some of the plants we're gonna talk about clean the soil, which means they also pick up those heavy metals. You know, um, So you wanna think about where you're harvesting from. Um, you want to think about the plants themselves and be really respectful of them. So are you harvesting? A lot of what we're looking at today, um, at least in our area, um, are super plentiful, what most people think of as weeds. Um, but you want to make sure that if you're harvesting something, you're only picking a little bit of each plant, making sure you don't pick your first plant you see, because that way you won't pick the last of the kind <laughs> that you see. Um, one of the resources that I'm going to share with you is Foraging Texas from uh, Meriwether, Mark Vorderbruggen. Um, and he actually lists plants by whether they're, you know, um, plentiful or rare or uncommon and um, how you should think about that if you harvest plants. Um, think about your safety for your harvesting plants. Um, and so there's lots of etiquette to um, going out and collecting plants. Mainly take the time to get to know um, who it is you're harvesting. And because there's lots of different things around you. A lot of the plants we're gonna be looking at are literally, you'll probably walk outside your, your front or back door and see them growing around you. Um, and the first lesson, once we get started, is I would say get low, because if you're looking at all of the greenery around you, um, it can be very overwhelming. Um, everything just looks green. So if you get down, you start noticing um, different things that are actually food and medicine. And so that's that same picture. Um, and these things that I'm pointing out are just a few of the things in that bunch of greens um, that we're going to be talking about that are food and medicine. OK, so now we're going to get out. Um, and man, I wish, I wish you could just feel the air out here. I mean, it's always a little bit cooler than the city. Um, it, it's a very special place. I don't know skies anywhere like the skies out here. The clouds are amazing. Um, so it's definitely a great place to come spend some time and get outdoors. Um, for the foraging piece and for hiking in general, um, just be prepared to, you know, while there are lots of really friendly plants for food and medicine, there are also stinging ones. <laughs> um, so I have, um, I wear boots and long pants and, you know, bring your water and let's go for a hike. So first up in the fields all around, it's dandelion. So if you're a gardener or you love a really manicured lawn, you probably hate dandelion. In fact, um, there's a huge poison market, right, for, for dandelion. Um, dandelions actually, what we, these dandelions came um, from Europe. Um, we have a lot of native kind of varieties. There's a Texas dandelion or a false dandelion that can sort of be used interchangeably. But dandelions, man, I don't know how many of you out there haven't actually made a wish on a dandelion seed head. Um, so, you know, they do lots of happy making. They're also one of the first foods for the bees after winter. Um, so they're really important for our pollinators. But more than that, 
any part of the dandelion, any time of the year is amazing food and medicine. Um, so dandelions are support for the liver. They offer um, eye health support. They are a digestive. They have tons of minerals and vitamins in them. And you really can use any part of this plant. Um, the leaves of the dandelion, especially early, if you can get them before they go to flower, um, you can recognize them in part because, um, so the, the French name for dandelion is, is Dent de Leon, and that's because the leaves of the dandelion look a lot um, like lion teeth, <laughs> that's the same. Um, so they have those really tooth leaves and um, early in the spring, they're the least bitter, but Bitter is really great for us. So we've tended to kind of um, weed <laughs> bitter from our diet, um, but that actual bitter taste gets our digestive system going. And so it's a really wonderful thing. So all over Europe, people have digestive bitters that they take. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. Um, the dandelion stems themselves, if you break them, they have a white, um, latex in them. And that um, has properties that are, uh, so, so one of the remedies for that, that um, latex is actually is like wart removal, like you would put it on warts and eventually they would go away. Um, people eat dandelion flowers, there's dandelion wine, um, the uh, root can be turned into medicine. So there's like literally every part of the dandelion is useful in every way. So if it's growing in your garden or in your yard, I would highly recommend that instead of poisoning it, you just pick it and eat it. <laughs> but also they have hollow stems. So they make really great straws or bubble wands. Wow. So for anyone trying to um, stop using plastic straws or such, just find yourself a good dandelion. Now dandelions are pretty amazing because they grow anywhere, right? You've seen them growing on cracks and sidewalks. Um, in undisturbed areas, they can get really big and the leaves can get really big. A lot of farmer's markets are now selling dandelion leaves. Um, where you mow all the time, they lay flat and get really small. Um, so if you can find yourself a nice, fresh, long stalk, um, it's great entertainment. Now I'll say at the end of this, I'm gonna talk a little more about some recipes and things like that. So, and, and we're only scratching the surface of all of this because we don't have a lot of time. Okay, so out in the fields, um, this is one of my favorite early spring plants, um, shepherd's purse. This is a wild mustard, a native wild mustard, but mainly I just love those little heart-shaped leaves. <laughs> so if you like things that taste horseradishy or, um, you know, are kind of spicy hot, this is a great addition to salads. This is a, um, throughout history has been used by midwives as a herb during childbirth, it staunches bleeding and hemorrhaging. So it's it's a pretty powerful midwife um, herb. And, um, and it's super pretty as a cut flower. So I maybe decorate with weeds and move them into my gardens. But um, so shepherd's purse is a great one um, with those little heart-shaped leaves. How did they make a, how did they use it for staunching blood, uh, bleeding? Yeah, so we'll talk, so when you make herbal medicine or food, like the way you prepare your plants <laughs> brings out different properties in them. Oh, so, sure. okay. Um, okay. if you want to bring out the, um, minerals in your plant, you will make an herbal vinegar or use vinegar in your salad or in your okay. cooking. And okay. it pulls out those minerals. If you want to bring out the toxins or what the medicine is, you'll use high proof alcohol. Oh, okay. I use hundred proof vodka and fresh plant. Usually not always. Sure. I mean, there are a million different ways to make herbal remedies and any herbalist you listen to will do it probably okay. a little different, but um, okay. the high, the alcohol pulls out the medicinal properties. Okay. Um, if you infuse it in water, um, you pull out the nutrients. Um, if you, um, you know, so there's, there's different ways to prepare it. So to, to, um, I would say probably tincturing it with the fresh plant and high proof alcohol. Um, cause it, it has a really long shelf life and you can put it in water or tea or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, so another thing that lives out 
in our big open fields is yellow dock or curly dock. We have a red dock. Um, all of them can be used um, interchangeably. When they're young, these um, green leaves, they're, they're really curled up. That's why they're called curl dock. Um, you can use those as a spinach replacement. Um, they're really high in vitamins. And um, as they go to seed, you get these, you may have seen them driving down the road somewhere, these really um, lovely rust colored seed stalks. And so dock is related to buckwheat. So you could actually mm -hmm. harvest those seeds and ground like a buckwheat flour. Mm -hmm. um, you can toast them. Um, Merriweather, who comes out, he comes twice a year and does programs out here, but he's brought us the toasted dock seeds that he mixes mm -hmm. with um, cream cheese and puts on crackers and um, they're pretty yummy. And then the root of yellow dock is real medicinal. Um, so it helps your body actually absorb iron. So if anemia is something that you're struggling with, um, you may want to investigate yellow dock. Um, it also helps with regularity, digestive regularity. Um, okay. So it's a pretty good one and really plentiful. <laughs> it, we have fields and fields of dock. Okay. So on our site, we are also um, on the El Camino Real de los Tejas. So part of that Royal Road that the Spanish traveled through the area. Now the El Camino began as actual roads that the Caddo used and hunting trails. And when the Spanish came, they actually said that these roads rivaled those in Paris. So they were traveling. And of course, as they traveled, they brought seeds as did the French when they came through. Um, and so on our site, if you come out, you can actually walk down a piece of the original road. Now I'll say when this, the, the Europeans came, the mound building Caddo had abandoned the mounds, right? But there were still Caddo villages in the area. And when the Spanish came, they were negotiating with those Caddo people nation to nation. Mm -hmm. um, so this next one is uh, Yopon Holly. Um, this is actually was used by the Caddo to make a drink called Black Drink. That they use during ceremony. Um, it is the leaves of this plant that um, you use. Its botanical name is Ilex vomitoria that comes from the berries. So <laughs> you, you won't want to be using the berries. Um, Yopon is the only caffeinated plant in Texas. Hmm. So when civilization breaks down and you are in desperate need of coffee, mm -hmm. um, Yopon is your friend. Um, and what you would do is you would dry the yopon um, and use the leaves like tea leaves. Um, they don't have any tannins, so they don't get bitter. So you can kind of use them over and over again. Although I'm sure the caffeine would decrease, you know, after each brewing. Uh, but you'd want to dry these leaves for a couple weeks or in your oven or however you want to do that. And then just have them handy to make tea with. Wow. Red buds. I don't know how many of you out there knew that red buds taste really good, but they taste really good and they're beautiful. Wow. So the buds are kind of sweet. Um, it's related to kind of sweet peas. And so you can eat the buds. They make a beautiful salad or, um, you know, any kind of topping. Um, and then when they produce the, the peas, essentially, um, they taste like sweet peas. So you can harvest those when they're young too. And they're really tasty. Plus they're beautiful. Alrighty, so now we're gonna go, go back in the woods a little bit. And so all along the edge in the shaded area, we have lots of great early spring salad um, plants and um, wonderful things to eat. So these are wild violets, another one that sometimes gardeners hate. Um, also really nutritious and wonderful for you. So you can cook up the leaves as greens. You, you do want to be a little careful with violets. You don't want to eat like, um, I, I did have a friend who got really excited um, about violets and like hooked up a whole pot of just like, like they were cooking up spinach leaves and it had some unfortunate digestive effects. <laughs> so you just, you know, you, you know, a cup of violets are fine. You probably wouldn't want to eat like a whole meal of violet leaves. Um, but they're wonderful to cook with. The flowers are edible. They've been used. Um, ours aren't super fragrant. I think in Europe, the violet flowers are really fragrant, but they've been used as um, 
you know, and, and skin stuff um, and witch hazel and then, you know, bass and all sorts of beauty things. Um, they also make really lovely ice cubes if you free them. <laughs> but violets um, are a wonderful source of vitamin A and C and all sorts of minerals. This little plant is called corn salad. Um, you only get it for like a couple weeks here. Um, it it um, goes to flower really, really fast, but it's um, a really just kind of tasty, crunchy, fresh green to add to salads and such. It's a fun one. Ah, chickweed, another one. So this came with the French as part of their salad garden. Um, it's another one that if you go out and look at your flower pots you might see or around your compost piles, it loves really um, rich soil. And it's another one that people try to get rid of and really they just need to eat it. Also, if you go to fancy restaurants and get salad, a lot of time it'll have chickweed in it now. Wow. Um, it's super fresh and yummy and very, very good for you. It's also a strong medicine um, as well as food. It's used... Um, I've used this one actually with my family to dissolve um, cysts, um, like those ganglion cysts that sometimes people sometimes get on their hands and stuff, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, taken internally. You can use it as a poultice. It's one that's used for pink eye a lot. Like you would just make a fresh sleep poultice and you can put it in the fridge where it's cold and put it directly on your eye. Um, it's really cooling and healing and um, has a, a lot of wonderful uses. Wow. And it makes a really great pesto and it has these really cute little white flowers. <laughs> so that then, then, so the salads, so if you use it in a salad, the flowers, everything, everything. The flowers, yep. everything, just chop yep. it up. Cool. Yeah. It goes, you know, it gets hot here so fast. So it, it goes to seed and gets kind of leggy and um, a little tougher, but especially early on, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes you'll find really dense patches with chickweed. Mm -hmm. um, This is a fun one. Most people see it and say clover, and it's not. Um, but it is a uh, wood sorrel or oxalis. And it is one of my favorite ones to show kids because it tastes like pickles or lemon. Mm. We, my my um, oldest granddaughter calls it pickle plant. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful. It's great in a salad if you like that kind of sour taste. If you cook with it, you use it at the very end or you kind of lose you know, you'll lose it in your meal, you, the flavor of it. Um, all versions of oxalis are edible. So there's, you know, really beautiful versions for gardens and things like that. Sometimes you'll see the bigger leaves with the pink flowers instead of the yellow flowers. Um, all edible, all tasty. Um, Is this ever kind of purplish? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it can be. You want to look for these little heart-shaped leaves. Um, yes. True clover doesn't have that heart shape leaves are just more oval. So this is a really fun one. This is cleavers. Um, people, I, I don't know. I mean, most kids know cleavers because they've picked it and stuck it to a friend's back at some point in their mm -hmm. life. Um, they're also called like Velcro plant or mm -hmm. clingy, you know, clinging cleavers. Um, they grow all over in big bunches. Um, I haven't tried this, but Meriwether said that um, in scouts, they would use them as strainers because they really, they stick together. Um, so, you, you know, in desperate times, you could use it as a strainer while you're out camping. Um, it is traditionally used as a spring tonic. So when you think about spring cleaning, you can think about cleavers as spring cleaning for your body. Um, a lot of times it's used as a cold infusion and we'll talk about that later too. Um, it's very green. It's very fuzzy and sticky. So I don't generally cook with it. I mean, I'm sure you could add a little bit to greens pesto, um, maybe cook it when it's fresh and young and saute it up in butter and garlic. Um, but it's, if you haven't ever played with it, you literally can stick it to yourself and wear it around all day. So, um, now it's a really gentle, um, it, it's, it has a lot of, um, benefits for the lymphatic system. It helps move lymph, which is probably one reason it's used a lot in the spring. Um, I also actually just heard this morning on an herbal podcast, um, the herbalist used cleavers and the chickweed because they're both super gentle as a, in a salve for children for rashes and things. Mm. So
and wild onions. We've got wild onions that the only thing that smells like onion um, and garlic are onions and garlic. So if you pick something that looks like an onion and it doesn't smell like an onion, it's not an onion <laughs> and you don't want to eat it. Yeah. Um, so. All right. So now we've done our first round of foraging and um, I, I, I like to make pretty baskets and take their picture. Yeah. <laughs> it's a thing <laughs> but so you have all of this wonderful stuff right and what are you going to do with it because one thing you want to be really careful about is just harvesting what you're going to eat or use in medicine making and not just getting really excited and picking all these things and then not having time to prepare them because nothing feels worse than a beautiful basket full of things that you let go to waste sure. <laughs> so you want to be ready for the whole process lots of washing and cleaning then you get this, right? Mm -hmm. So we've done several foraging programs out here um, where we forage for our own salads and had like, you know, potluck lunches. Um, and so these are just, you can see in this picture, you've got red buzz and dandelion and wild onions and chickweed. And so really whatever you can find, you can use in your salad. Now, I, I will say that when you use the dandelion flowers, you wanna get rid of the green that, um, around the flower because that's super bitter. So you really mm -hmm. just want to use the petals of the dandelion flower. Mm -hmm. I've, had, another. I've had someone ask um, any, maybe at, at the end or something, if any books that you might recommend. For yeah, and we'll, I have mm -hmm. some at the end and we'll talk about okay. that. At the awesome. End, for that's sure. great. That's great. Um, so you. this salad has corn salad and chickweed and violets and red buds. So you can really you know, be super creative with your wild green salad. It's gorgeous. <laughs> um, when I'm really good and I'm not always really good, I try to bring home salad. My husband is a huge lover of salad um, because really you can go outside and collect all of these things. Um, I can do most of it in my backyard at home um, and, and have a beautiful salad. And again, you know, think about getting the vitamins and nutrients out of all of these amazing wild greens. So if you use olive oil and vinegar, you're gonna pull out the most you can of vitamins and minerals and nutrients from your salad. Right. Then you want that fat and that vinegar. Yeah. I was told a long time ago that if you have, even when like when you eat like a spinach salad, that if you, you have to have an acid to draw the iron out of the spinach that you, that which is why, um, which is why like when a spinach salad, a lot of times you'll have oranges, like mm. orange slices or whatever, or some kind of, some kind of citric, citrus uh, with the spinach salad. I know I, I was told that a long time ago. Yeah. Which is why I always and the to... oil, like, um, I'll say cook it in quotes, but it breaks down the cell wall, of the plants. And so you get more of the nutrients in it. Mm -hmm. So the olive oil is really important actually. Yeah for all sorts of reasons. Um, so this is a wild greens pesto. This is one of my favorite things to do in the spring. And at the end, I, I have a link to just a master kind of recipe, but really I just go collect like two cups of wild greens. Um, sometimes I'll use basil too, um, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And and then I use some nut, you know, it just depends on what I have on hand and a little bit of Parmesan cheese and olive oil and garlic and you get this wonderful wild greens pesto. Um, and it's a little different every time because it really relies on what I can gather. Um, and it's fun. Now I will say dandelion greens, remember are super bitter. So I will, um, I, I think maybe one bitter to two parts, not, you know, mm -hmm. a really mild tasting grain is probably good, just depending on your tolerance for bitter. Sure. Um, but remember bitter is also really good for you. So, yeah. Um, and then, it, you know, I'm trying to get in the habit of just going outside in the morning and grabbing something for my eggs, because that's the mm -hmm. easiest way to get wild greens into your diet, right? So this is dandelion. I had some leftover dandelion, but really chickweed, I mean, any of those things that we've talked about, you can just add to your eggs in the morning, um, and have a way more nutritious Okay, I'm partial to breakfast tacos, breakfast sure. taco, but whatever you want to do. <laughs> um, this is the cold cleaver infusion that I actually made this spring. Um, and you literally just put cleavers, fresh cleavers in a jar. And I 
um, added some orange and some rosemary to this. I had just listened to another podcast. I have a commute, a 40 minute commute to work. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, but rosemary is specific for um, the heart and, and um, grieving and comfort. And I kind of figured that in this day and age, we all could use a little rosemary. So I added rosemary to my infusion. Um, the cleaver infusion, you brew cold. Some infusions, we'll talk about you, you brew hot, but cleavers, you would just put, you know, a bunch of cleavers in a jar, whatever else you want to flavor your water. Like I said, I used orange and rosemary, fill it up with water and stick it in the fridge overnight and then strain it. And you have a wonderful spring tonic. Great for the lymph system. So we talked about... Can you, tell, can you tell us the name of your the podcast that you listen to? Oh, there are so many. Oh, okay. um, there's, I think at the end, I put one called Herbs by Rosalie. That's a great okay. place to start. Okay. Uh, but there, there are a lot of them now. So when you listen to someone like uh, Rosalie de Flore, um, she interviews a lot of other herbalists. Okay. <laughs> and so you can kind of see who you like and how they... Okay talk about the work because what you'll see is there's this whole spectrum of people who work with plants um uh, like people who really look first at all the chemical properties and the science and all the work that's mm -hmm. been done mm -hmm. all the way down to the wise woman tradition where they're really it's sort of folk medicine and working with the plants um and um so you have people who've done degrees and people who have just had the information passed down from generations and you just kind of have to find what feels comfortable for you sure. Sure. Um, so this is a citrus spiced dandelion bitters um, that I made. I, we had that beautiful dandelion you saw earlier was growing mm -hmm. in our garden. And so it did eventually have to move. So I harvested it and made these bitters. And so digestive bitters, you take um, like these are brewed in alcohol. Um, and I, um, after straining them, after about uh, six weeks or so, um, put them in just uh, medicine dropper bottles mm -hmm. and so you would just take you know a dropper full or something 10 minutes before meals or after a really heavy meal just to help with digestion um this recipe's at the end too it's a it's a it was a super actually tasted really good so this is a wild green soup um yeah. i try to do something like this in the spring um again it would be different every time you made it because it would depend on what you get you need a couple cups of greens um i also use the flowers uh, potato and onion and celery and stock you know whatever you want um there's you can google wild green soup and there are a lot of recipes out there in the world um and i just sort of wing it but you can see the beautiful red buds on top <laughs> um and again, another great way to get what, talk about eating local and in season, right? Beautiful. Okay. Yeah, we're going to take a little walk. So we have, yeah. um, out of Caddo Mounds, we have many acres of what we've restored, um, done restored um, tall grass prairies. Um, we actually have another 30 acres we've just seeded. Um, but there's also, you know, lots of just grassland. And... My maintenance guys um, think I'm crazy and, <laughs> and get a little, uh, you know, irritated when I'm like, you see this giant patch of, pat, you know, patch of beautiful passion flowers? You can't mow it ever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have fields of passion flowers. So you can imagine like thousands of these beautiful purple flowers, right? Growing in fields. Um, and passion flower is a native. It is one of my favorites um when, when we have workshops with teachers and things it's we we go out and we make passion flower tincture it mm -hmm. is specific for um calming anxiety mm -hmm. and for um when you have um when you wake up with those real circular thoughts you know and you just can't get back to sleep and um passion flower is actually specific for that plus it's wow beautiful. so you can use it dried as a tea you can buy it commercially as tea or um you can tincture it and one thing i learned is most people don't have thousands of flowers because when you make medicine with it you pick them when they're like 
you know, beautiful and ripe, but we do. So I've made tincture that's all flower. <laughs> um, and it, the leaves and the little tendrils apparently have more of the compound that makes you sleepy. So you can kind of, you know, it's, it's not just a science with how much a plant and how much vodka. Um, it's a little bit of an art. So you can decide whether you want your tincture to make you um, more tired or you just want it more soothing. And you can kind of play with the ratios you use of what part of the plant. Passionflower also produces, one of its common names is maypop. It produces these um, passionflower fruits. Um, and when you step on them, they pop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and they have little seeds inside. I don't know if you've ever eaten mm -hmm. passionflower fruit. Um, mm. the, you, you don't want to eat it until it's like all wrinkly and looking overripe. And um, one thing I do with my boss is I feed him things. And so before <laughs> I knew that... <laughs> It's like, here, eat this. But you, it's kind of like a pomegranate. <laughs> yeah, I do it all the time, Georgia. Um, and so when you open up the, the fruit, you have all these little seeds that you eat like pomegranate seeds. And, and they're pretty tasty. People make passion um, flower fruit jelly. You can, you, know, you can buy it commercially in all sorts of ways. It is also the host plant for this uh, fritillary butterfly. So um, oh, nice. they mm -hmm. will devour your plant. Um, but have no fear, it will come back in 50 more places. So you have to be real careful where you plant it, but um, it's a fun one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm clicking the wrong thing. There's the fruit for you. <laughs> and uh, here is the actual flowers. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And then here's my basket. Like oh, I said, how lovely. Oh, uh, passion flowers. Um, and when you make medicine with, like, if you're going to um, tincture plants, um, you really want to have your jar and your alcohol handy because the quicker you put that plant mm -hmm. in alcohol, you know, the, the fresher and stronger mm -hmm. your medicine probably is. So not, it's yeah. not always possible, but if you can mm -hmm. carry your vodka in your jar, it's, it's. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious about, so you, you did like official, official training right you are you went to like well, like like that's a story that probably requires evening drinks okay. um, I <laughs> I've done a lot of on-site um training and I did run off to Georgia I mean to New York for a um, okay okay an apprenticeship but that's a story for a different time okay okay <laughs> it was an experience let's put it that okay, way okay okay so this is a oh, uh, passion flower that. Um, that I've, I've tinctured, right? Wow. Um, oh. So it's super beautiful. I mean, it, it fades over time, but you will leave, so, when you tincture a plant like this, you leave it for six weeks, you know, just kind of put it on a shelf. You can shake it, you know, it's, I mean, it is as easy as cutting up fresh plant matter in a jar, filling it to the top. You don't even have to pack it down super tight. You just want to fill it. You fill that jar with, I use 100 proof vodka. Some people use, you know, Everclear or something like that to the top, screw on the top, shake it up, make sure you don't need to add more of your, your, your alcohol. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, six weeks later you have plant medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And is that the jelly? That is beauty berry jelly. Oh, that okay. I tried to make. Yeah. Okay. So we also have ponds and swamps and, well, and um, alligators on property. Mm -hmm. So this particular pond we call Snappy's Pond. Mm -hmm. um, my best guess is that it's an alligator training pool. I don't really know if that's a thing, but I like the way that sounds because yeah. we have a baby alligator and they get to a certain size and they move away. Mm -hmm. And then a new one comes. Oh. So we call them little Snappy. This is Snappy's mm -hmm. Pond. Mm -hmm. um, Kuhu is the Caddo word for alligator. Mm -hmm. um, he makes us very happy. So again, all down by the water, we have all these different areas and there's all different plants to learn in all these areas. Um, but really you could learn one or two plants for this whole year and have all sorts of valuable food and medicine just from those two plants. Really, if you just use dandelion, you know, you'll, you'll right. get so many benefits. I asked, have someone ask, um, do you have a non-alcoholic process? Yeah, so there, um, I, I don't because it's not an issue for me, but people use uh, glycerin, um, teas. There's, there's actually um, 
Uh, I forgot her name. There's um, the a Southern herbalist, and that may be the name of her book, but she, you know, she's right in um, Alabama, I believe. And so there's a yeah. lot of non-alcohol drinking people in that area. And so she does a lot with teas and all sorts of things. So you can, okay. you know, there's all different ways to use these plants. Sure. Um, so this is mullen. Um, mullen also came um, much later with the mm. colonist. Um, and has sort of colonized everywhere. You probably see it driving down roads or in mm -hmm. fields. Um, it gets really big. It's a biennial plant. And so the first year it puts out this big basil rosette, this kind of fluffy basil rosette. And the second year it puts up these stalks with lots and lots of flowers. Um, Mullen is one of my favorites. Um, it is useful in so many ways. And it's amazing to just sit and watch a mullen plant. I've never seen so many insects and small animals and things around a plant like this mullen. And the dragonflies love to um, cool off in the summer on top of the mullen. And that makes me really happy. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, but so mullen, if, you, if you've never felt mullen, it's, it's really fuzzy. Um, soft, big, big leaves. Um, some people say that you can use it as toilet paper, mm -hmm. like it's it's hunter's friend, camper's friend. Um, mm -hmm. But what makes it soft are all these little hairs on the mullen. Mm -hmm. They come off when you rub it on your skin. So I would I would use cautiously and test it yeah. out on a piece of skin to see um, how sensitive you are to that. Um, but again, the whole mullen plant is useful, right? So the, this is one that you'll see growing in the summer and it is great to find it and um, make some winter medicine because uh, mullen is a friend to the respiratory system and the lungs. So when COVID hit, I went out and brewed really large jars of mullen um, um, tincture, which again, you just find these beautiful leaves. You want to just make sure the leaves look really healthy and good. Mm -hmm. And you cut them up in a jar and fill your jar and add the alcohol. And six weeks later, you have a really strong lung support um, medicine. You can also use it as tea um, for sure. You can buy dried mullen. You can buy a lot of these herbs in bulk, you know, if you want to, um, an infusion, Georgia, we had talked about a cold infusion with the cleavers, but hot infusions mm -hmm. are like, um, so a tea, you have a little bit of herb and water and you brew it for just a short time, right? An infusion, you have a lot of herb, like an ounce or more of herb and um, a quart of water and you brew it for four hours or overnight before you strain it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just, um, you, you know, brew just, it, you mean you steep, it steeps? Yeah, so steeps. you would leave it overnight with the plant, um, just okay. pour boiling water in it. Okay. And um, you get a really healing. There's all sorts of herbs that you use for that. Usually non, um, you wouldn't use real aromatic herbs for that long steeping process like mint or chamomile. Okay. It's for things like mullen and mm -hmm. um, chickweed you could use, you could cleavers, I mean, anything like that. But okay. Um, I use this one a lot. I use it in allergy season whenever I get that kind of just dry allergy cough. Mm -hmm. um, it works really fast. It wears off. So I, I just put dropper fulls in my water bottle and, mm -hmm. you know, have that handy when that hits. Um, mm. So it's really soothing that way. The flowers, these beautiful mullen flowers mm -hmm. um, are traditionally used to make um, either alcohol tinctures or oils for ear aches. So, you know, you would want to think about what kind of earache you have, right? So if it's mm -hmm. like swimmer's ear or fluidy, you would want to use the mullen and alcohol so it would dry that up. Mm -hmm. And if it wasn't, you could use it in the oil and it'd be really soothing. Mm -hmm. um, I have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. So um, one woman asked, I'm curious, what kind of efforts are y'all taking to ensure that native plants are cultivated across your land? and keeping non-native invasive plants at bay? So we're not. I mean, so, so there's several different ways to look at that, right? Um, I don't know if any of you have read Robin Kimmermer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, but I love it. She um, mm -hmm. She's an indigenous woman and a botanist. And mm -hmm. in her book, she, um, she addresses a question of, um, 
if people be, can become indigenous to space. And basically she says no, but they can become naturalized to place. And she uses plants as the metaphor for that. Um, and so we have some plants, right, that come in and have been here so long that a lot of them think of them as natives. And, and the Caddo, you know, in modern times would have started using those plants as well. Um, so they're now naturalized to the space. Um, and so we don't spend our time trying to get rid of those. Um, um, we do, we are working on different land conservation things for the site. So we, um, we are propagating and protecting some of those native um, culturally significant plants like river cane and, and the, the grasses and prairie grasses and things. Um, so it just depends. I mean, there are some invasives that we do try to get rid of. Things like Chinese privet <laughs> and Chinese tallow and things like that. So this is a, wow, I'm using up my time. So this is um, a recipe for mullen chai, which is super yummy. So you would, one, you would make that mullen infusion with the water, um, you know, where you brew it overnight and strain it with dried, you would use dried mullen for that. And then you add more milk and chai spices and you have a really wonderful um, drink for the winter, especially if you have any kind of respiratory stuff. And obviously you're washing the leaves and flowers and stuff. Yeah, you, you wash them. I mean, yes, you will wash your, your stuff. You, but that, you like won't want to wash it. Um, if you're, you want to make sure that one, when you harvest from medicine making, you, you do it usually midday or late. You want it to be dry and not wet because mm -hmm. the water can cause a problem. So I don't necessarily wash the things that I tincture. I mean, they're going in alcohol and then they're being oh, okay. strained. So, okay. Okay. um, so just real quick, quick, so we have time for a question or two, if you have okay. them, this is plantain. Um, this is actually the example that Robin Kimmerer talks about when she talks about becoming naturalized to place and talking about plants because, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, there we go, <laughs> plantain. Um, because plantain, it came in and it supports everything around it, including the people. It's really good medicine. It actually, one of its common names is white man's shoe because the seeds would get stuck and, you know, people, mm -hmm. um, all of the, explorers as they come it would get stuck in their shoes and spread all over um, but it doesn't damage the area and it is really healing to all skin ailments this is a fun one because you can show people that in the you know when they're out if you get stung or you have a cut you can chew up a piece of plantain leaf and do a spit poultice which grosses out all the kids um, yeah. but is super great and you can actually use plantain these veins that go all the way down the leaf you can use um and tie you can kind of strip a little bit and tie it and make an, a band-aid you know so you can wow. use your spit poultice and tie the plantain around it and it's really healing yeah. it's used a lot in salves and as food mm -hmm. and actually the seeds of the plantain not this variety but um are a really great source of fiber and it's what metamucil is made out of mm -hmm. a different yeah species of plantain mm -hmm. okay so Georgia, I don't know if you can make these slides available or what, but this, um, Foraging Texas, it's just foragingtexas.com. I would definitely start there. Herbs with Rosalie is a free podcast, and she's got a lot of resources on her website. Great. I do actually subscribe to this Herb Mentor website. Um, it's like $60 a year, I think, and it has, it's full of like full-blown classes and all sorts of things. It's a really wonderful resource, but there are lots of free resources out there now. Great. That's great. And uh, all right. Question? So we've, we've been answering your questions as, as we went along and the last one was, was about washing, washing the, the leaves. But, you know, I was curious about like, what do you, you know, if you're using a flower, do you like wash the flower and wash the pollen off or do you, you know, no, I don't. Yeah. I, I'm not particularly, um, as long as it's not been, well, obviously you're not going to want to use it if, someone's been using pesticides on it, obviously, but yeah, if it's so your, you, yeah. You don't want to pick plants where, you know, people walk their dogs on the edge yeah. of the walkway, <laughs> you know, things like that. You want to think yeah. about where you harvest your plants from. Yeah. Um, I dust them off. I wash leaves if they're really dirty. I eat a lot of things as I walk around. I snack on plants. <laughs> I'm, I mean, yeah. Someone oh, is no. asked, someone's just asked, um, is sassafras useful or does it grow or does it grow where you 
are. Yes, and I love sassafras. Um, it's really soothing to the throat and like coughs. It tastes very yummy. I don't know if you've ever picked sassafras leaves, but if you haven't done this and you have one around, if you pick it and smell, it smells like Fruit Loops. It's one way to know sassafras. Is that also called Oja Santa? Is that what that is? No, I'm, th I'm thinking root, root beer plants, I'm thinking. Yeah, well, and it, it was used to make, um, the roots were used to make sassafras um, okay. root beer. Um, okay. And you can make sassafras tea. And... Okay, okay, okay. Now, the very first question that we had, and I only, I kind of answered part of it for her. Um, and this woman asked um, who, about who currently owns the 400 acres. And I told her, you know, the state of Texas owns and preserves it. But what would it take? What would it take to return the land to the Caddo Nation? Yeah, I mean, that's always the question, right? Um, and I do not know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that we are as good as we can be as custodians, but it's never the same as the Caddo having their own land and returning right. here. Um, so maybe one day that'll happen, but I don't know what that process really is with yeah. the state. Um, yeah. I will say that fortunately, through a lot of luck probably, but then through the state acquiring the land, um, there hasn't been a crazy amount of looting. And so these mounds, mm. like this mound in the picture here is actually a burial mound and it was a burial mound for the elite. So there was some archeology span done on all of these mounds but none of them were fully excavated. Um, and all of the materials that were collected from the site are at the Texas Archeological Research Laboratory in Austin. Um, with an, they're all going through the process of NAGPRA um, and they you know, actually belong to the Caddo. So there's an agreement between the Caddo and Tarl about those um, objects, but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, so another person asked, are there any field guides that you recommend, not just on the phone, but hard copy as well? Sure. Um, now, Meriwether has a great book. Um, mm -hmm. It's an Idiot's Guide to Foraging, um, and he's got mm -hmm. really wonderful pictures, and most of the plants are ones that you're gonna find right outside. Um, that's a great one. There's one called Botany in a Day that lets you learn plant families. So like if you find something and you know it's a mint, right? You know that in general, mints are really good for this, you know, um, soothing the stomach and digestion, and you probably aren't going to hurt yourself with it. Um, and so it's important to learn how to identify plant families as well. Um, so I would start there. There's lots of them. I mean, there's all sorts of field guides, but um, those will get you started. Awesome. That's great. Okay. Were there artifacts uh, spared following the tornado? And when do you anticipate the grass house being open to the public once again? Yeah. So fortunately, when the historic commission took over this site from Texas Parks and Wildlife, um, one of the things that the Caddo was important to our Caddo partners was that we didn't have the objects, the real um, artifacts in the museum, yeah. because most of those artifacts, right, the whole Caddo pottery and all of those beautiful things were from the burials. Um, right. So those are no longer on display. So really the only things in the museum were replicas um, with the exception of some contemporary Caddo art. So we really didn't lose any of that. Um, good. Good. And <laughs> the grass house, as soon as it's built, it's open to the public. So um, we're hoping the new museum will be done this summer too. Um, so if with luck next fall, maybe we can have a big grand opening event. Okay. That's great. Um, also, someone's asking about watercress. How can you determine, is it actually watercress and does it grow in rivers in the hill country? I'm not, I, I don't know is that, a, that, is that a... actually. Um, but I will tell you that if you go to... Um, I know I'm promoting Meriwether a lot here. It's just because he comes twice a year and he has great resources that are free. But um, if you go to his website, you can look by plant and I know watercress is there. And he not only tells you how to identify it, but he'll talk about toxic mimics and he shows where they're located and he shows whether they're common or uncommon or rare. And so it's a great starting place for all of us in, um, in Texas, for sure. Okay. I think, um, thank you so much, Rachel. This is awesome. And I've learned a lot and I'm going to, I'm going to keep looking. I'm going to keep, I, the only thing I've ever made for myself is vanilla, but the vanilla nice. beans, have, vanilla beans have gotten so expensive that I, <laughs> that I, that I haven't done that in a long time. Yeah. But, and uh, I just pick like, find one plant that calls to you and just spend time learning about that because pretty much every plant I've showed you, you could 
spend a year making different foods and medicine yeah. and getting to know all, yeah. all about it. Someone asked, what is Meriwether's full name? Mark Vorderbruggen. Huh. Okay. <laughs> Vorderbruggen. Yeah. Vorderbruggen. Um, maybe I will, let's see. I think I put his book. Let's see what I put here. No, nope, I just put Foraging Texas, but if you go there, you'll see his full name. So, the, so it's called Foraging Texas. Yeah. So the name of yeah. the book is called um, Foraging Texas. Foraging. And if you will, I, you will get a link to this. Um, you'll, you'll get a link to this webinar after, after the webinar is over. So you'll be able to like stop at the links and uh, you'll be able to see, um, to see what those links are. I don't know if you'll be able to click on them or not the recipes as well. So, and we're getting lots of people, um, saying, thank you, that it was a great informative and great presentation. And I'm, I'm dittoing all of that. Um, oh yeah, we don't, I mean, people are asking about the pods on mesquite. I don't think we don't have time for any more of that. That's actually another, maybe we could do another one at some point. And we have, I, and we have lots of programs coming up at Caddo. I mean, oh, if you're yes. near Georgia and San Antonio, I know there's lots of opportunities and around Austin, there's some great yeah. herb schools in Austin. So yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to let everybody know that on the 14th of April, we have a webinar with the UTSA special collections. We're going to be talking to one of the librarians there about their recipe, their Mexican uh, recipe book collection. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then on the 20th of, uh, of April, did I say October? I meant April, I'm April 14th of April. And then on the 20th of April, we've got a webinar with uh, Dr. Francis Galan, and he's going to be talking to us about his book called, I'm sorry, I'm looking at my other screen, which is where my, my web page opened up. It's called Los Adais, the first capital of Spanish Texas. And Kristen's going to be doing both of those, um, both of those webinars. So um, Rachel, thank you again. It was great Thanks. and um, loved it. Just loved it. And um, let's see, there you go. Thank you so much. Thank you all, all right, and have thanks. a wonderful weekend. Thanks, Rachel. Bye.